Okay, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for attending. This is our third part of a four-part series sponsored by Multistack on advanced chillers and chiller design. Um, the final part in this four-part series will be next Thursday at 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. We are recording this and it will be posted on our website. So if we can hold the questions to the end, um, we'll, uh, we'll address those. Uh, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom for questions. You can also use the chat feature if you just want to say um, hi or have something to say that might be relevant. Uh, we appreciate those comments very much. Um, if you do register to attend all four seminars and, um, and you fill out the short survey at the end, you're going to be registered in a drawing to win a Traeger grill. So uh, it won't be too long. We'll all be outside grilling. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, excited to hear who wins that. Um, if your company does have a policy about not, um, not accepting gifts, uh, there's an opt-out uh, um, ability in the survey. So please just uh, opt out of that and we'll make sure that we exclude you from the drawing. Um, however, we appreciate your attendance and we hope you get something out of it uh, for everybody. Um, if for some reason, um, by the way, click on the survey. If you want a PDH credit, copy the presentation, link to the video. And um, if you have anything uh, question-wise, uh, please just, um, there's a place that you can fill that out or you can send something to me and I'll, we'll address that. Our guest speaker today is Bruce Barrett. He's the regional sales manager at Multistack. And so, uh, you know, without any more, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce and let's get started. So Bruce, let's learn about air cool chillers. All right. Thanks again, Keith, for the opportunity. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing um, on the air-cooled modular product line, as well as some package chillers at the end. Um, you know, the general consensus is that air-cooled chillers are typically for, for smaller jobs. Of course, you've got to find some place outside. Um, what where we're going to we're going to drive uh, today's discussion is really the benefits of, of modular chillers, um, some of the offerings that we have to fill some of the gaps, the holes that we have in our, um, that are required in the market, you know, um, from small package chiller perspective. Um, it, you know, it's often said that, you know, the air-cooled is not as attractive or as exciting. And I certainly get excited talking about modular air-cooled chillers because of all the benefits um, over and above some of our package chiller offerings uh, because of the complexity of job. Um, redundancy and critical cooling requirements are, are a big part of today's uh, world, both for comfort cooling, uh, critical cooling being data centers, process applications. Um, they, can, they can have a lot of challenges uh, that add a lot of cost and um, modular fills a lot of those gaps in to reduce that first cost. Um, installation cost savings as well for uh, the application of modular chillers. The picture on the right there, absolutely a challenge in downtown Chicago, uh, the Merchandise Mart building where uh, it's about 28 stories high. Um, it's surrounded by the Chicago River and uh, double-decker streets with uh, subway rails. So it's hard to put a crane on the ground. It'll fall right through. So they have to do a lot of helicopter lifts in downtown Chicago. Well, it's a lot cheaper to lift modular chillers up there one at a time, set them on the roof, go back down and pick out another one versus one humongous helicopter and uh, much more much more cost and, and safety concerns. Uh, we're gonna talk about future capacity and add-on, how easy it is with modular chillers, turn down, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal versus a package chiller. I'll go into that more later. Much more lower ambient capabilities, meaning um, zero degrees is a typical standard low ambient condition. We can go really all the way down to about minus 40, minus 50 uh, with some accessories that we can place upon modular chillers. Our standard low ambient capability is minus 20. So that covers... Uh, Boy, you hope that covers 95% uh, of the states. Um, optional free cooling. Uh, it's much easier with a modular chiller. Uh, we've got a couple different variants that I'll talk about. Uh, more maintainable. And by that, I mean, when you've got modular chillers in an array, if you do have a failure of a component, hopefully you've built in some redundancy there and it doesn't become an emergency. 
Um, you can maintain your chilled water capabilities even with a, uh, a failure of a singular component. And lastly, sound sensitive installations, um, air cold chillers, they're outside. There's often um, sound boundary requirements in different municipalities. There might be just flat out sound requirements for a manufacturing facility. Uh, people are becoming more aware of um, um, damage to the, to the ear from prolonged uh, sound from coming from air cold chillers. We've got some ways to compensate for that. So modular chillers, quick review. So it is um, two independent refrigerant circuits per module. Uh, it's mounted, it can be mounted on a structural platform. They're all connected in parallel. Uh, so they can be controlled in a variable primary flow situation, primary, secondary. Uh, they do share a common master controller. Um, from the previous slide, this is actually the result of that helicopter lift on top of the Merchandise Mart down in Chicago. I'm, I'm guarantee you've seen it. It's a, at one time, it was the largest structure in North America, has its own zip code. So uh, thousands and thousands of offices within that building. Easily got the uh, modules 45 minutes, small helicopter, one module at a time, dropped in place, wired, plumbed in less than an hour. So redundancy, let's spend a few minutes talking about that. A typical redundant air-cooled system may require, in this case, uh, 120 tons as your load. You need a full chiller of 120 tons as backup. If one of the other chiller fails, you're back down to 120 tons. Uh, the modular concept is, a, I think, a lot easier. It, it saves a lot of footprint. Footprint can mean installed cost. Uh, in this example, I've got four 30-ton modules to build my 120-ton chiller. I've got an extra 30-ton module for redundancy that would stack into that array. You could add two modules, three modules, four modules. Uh, so we're not counting on catastrophic failure for the entirety of that bank. Maybe just one module, one flow switch, uh, et cetera. Talk a little bit more about that. So when you talk about total installed cost, a modular machine is going to be higher priced, but there's less installed cost given the footprint, wiring, et cetera. Um, a customer who really uh, personifies that need for uh, redundancy is our customer, the US, US Department of State. We've got over 330 chillers around the world. A lot of those are at embassies, consulates. Um, a lot of them do comfort cooling. Some are doing critical cooling. Uh, they've got a relatively small campus footprint, so they don't have the room for multiple large machines. So they do a, lot, a tremendous amount of modular for that redundancy component. Who might want these? Well, absolutely data centers come to mind at first, but manufacturing with critical processes, medical and process cooling, um, ice arenas. Um, if they have a failure, they, they need ice. They need backup. Uh, again, all of those components of a modular chiller built in redundancy, added reliability, even though a component may fail. Ease of service, it may not be an emergency if a, if a module goes down or a compressor goes down. Efficiency, let's not forget a modular chiller can be very efficient. And the recovery time. Um, a modular chiller may not be a fit for every job. If they want the lowest cost, uh, chilled water, comfort cooling, probably not a good fit. But if there's some need for redundancy, reliability, service backup, free cooling, and that recovery time, you know, does that cu customer want a certain peace of mind on this project? Modular might be the way to do it. Uh, one component of our modular and water-cooled chiller line is establishing no single point of failure. And we've got an option that we, got, we call fail, FRM or fail to run mode. Um, when we have those critical jobs, we don't rely upon a single chiller's phase monitor. If that phase monitor is fickle, that can take the entire chiller down. It's a, it's a $150 part or less. A flow switch, a singular flow switch on a chiller, if that's funky, that can take your entire chiller down. If your master controller, lightning strike, a voltage surge, rips through your transformer, that can take your master controller out. 
Um, we've got accessory controls on there such that if your master coat goes down, the slave controllers take over making chilled water out of each individual module. This FRM option also has a phase monitor on every module and a flow switch on every module. So one of those components fails, it's not gonna take the entire chill down. We also have very fast restart time with our scroll compressors. We can load up a compressor every five seconds. So it's simply doing the math. 10 compressors, one every five seconds, 50 seconds to full load. Very, very fast restart time. Certainly there can be things taken on um, in the design of your system, we're adding large buffer tanks, slowing the loop volume down, along with the fast restart time is gonna give you a very stable system. Again, very low cost option. Phase monitors are cheap, flow switches are cheap. The software is already written. Uh, it's a very low cost, a high value add. Add on capacity, it could be planned or not. Um, in this application, I'm showing a picture where they had planned expansion. They put in some spool pieces to allow as a placeholder for their total footprint. And they actually added on modules later. Easy enough to uh, drain your system, remove the headers, drop in the additional modules, victolically couple them back up, add your control wiring and you're off. Um, this, this took about an hour and a half to add 60 tons of capacity. Or as we show on the left-hand side of this machine, you could simply pull the caps off, add on the, to the, uh, add on the new module, victolically couple, add your control wiring. So there's a, there's a number of different ways you can plan for expansion or plan uh, or add on, even though you didn't plan for such expansion. A great example of a modular chiller with 2N redundancy. They wanted a full 100% capacity redundancy and they wanted redundancy on individual banks. So this was, um, this was a very nice um, AES job in SIVA data, data Center in Hiawatha. Iowa's medical records are kept in this building, so very secure. Uh, they cannot afford to have power down when medical records are being shared over the internet. Uh, we've got three banks of five modules each. Um, two of those modules happen to be free cools. Um, so making 50 degree water, which is warm from a comfort cooling standpoint. So the free cooling in Iowa gets a tremendous amount of run hours without beating up compressors at 10 degrees or less, for example. Um, interestingly, inside the building, um, Three Grunfoss pumps, uh, they had an N plus one configuration on the pumps. Um, the two banks here had two different power supplies from two different electrical companies. So the highest level, the highest tier data center, uh, full 2N redundancy. Quick story about the uh, flow switches. This did have the full FRM package, failed to run mode package. It had uh, flow switches on every module. It had the phase monitors and the software. We did have a failure on one of the flow switches. A squirrel chew chewed the wire. So they had tremendous capacity redundancy, even though they lost a flow switch. Um, it wasn't an emergency to go in there and fix it. Once they discovered the flow switch was bad, the wire was chewed, um, less than a $150 replacement for that part. A uh, little bit of labor, and they're off and running back at, at a full 2N capacity. I had to take this picture when the louvers were off. They, had, they called them hurricane louvers in Iowa, but uh, high wind uh, tornado louvers really in the end. Another good example of critical cooling loads. So um, the picture on the top is a little closer picture of the arrow pointing down on the left-hand side of the roof. It's on United Hospital in St. Paul. Uh, they had about uh, four or five MRI machines and at any given moment, one of their MRI machines was down because the chiller was down. Compressor was bad, a leaky coil, whatever it might be. So that MRI machine became inoperable. MRI machines are a mon money printer. They cost about a million bucks and they pay back in about a year. 
If they're not running, they're losing money at the hospital. So we had a conversation. We do sell MRI replacement chillers. We started talking about the economics of replacing all of those singular uh, one for one chiller to MRIs with a modular ma machine with built in redundancy. Um, that modular machine in our proposal also had free cooling. So in the cold Minnesota winters, when they're trying to deliver 53 degree water to the MRI machines, we're not running any compressors for about four and a half, five months. We're not beating those compressors up under low ambient conditions. Um, you'll see on the right hand side, that is a helipad. Uh, there's rocks on the roof. One of our coils took a rock through it. It was not an emergency to repair that coil because it was in the cold of winter. Um, the hospital took their time, ordered the parts. When it warmed up outside and they didn't, the mechanics didn't freeze their hands, they replaced that coil. They never lost capacity. Uh, they've estimated their return on investment, even though these chillers cost much more than a replacement, their return on full return on investment was about a year and a half for this machine. They've had zero downtime. All right, what do modular chillers do different? What we do is quite a bit different than package chillers. When they have a scroll or small screw machine, um, they often have what they call fan troll. They've got um, standard fans that are on and off, but they have one or two of their fans controlled by a VFD. They've got to build enough head pressure, control the fans well enough to build that head to be able to start those compressors. Um, the lead compressor in that array. So the best they could possibly do is typically down to zero degrees Fahrenheit running on those low ambient conditions. Now that might be enough, but occasionally if you dip below zero, those compressors have a heck of a hard time starting. They may get liquid, liquid slugging. Uh, they may have lost all of, their, all of their refrigerant in their condenser and it's hard to get that back. Don't have enough lift from those compressors to push everything back. What a modular chiller does, we have individual modules that could either have fan controlled both fans controlled with a VFD or be ECM fans. Um, we have a loop system with a valve control. We call that flooded head pressure control. So we're gonna drive refrigerant around, push, push, push with our compressors. We're gonna store it in a very oversized receiver so that when that compressor is ready to start, we've, we move that refrigerant to where it should be. Uh, we can go down to minus 20 as standard with that flooded head pressure control methodology. We've even done jobs down to minus 40. We've got some air-cooled chillers in Antarctica right now. Uh, of course, they've got free cooling. Hopefully that free cooling is enough capacity to carry them at some point. But if a free cool gets a leak uh, or something happens to the fans, they do rely on their mechanical cooling all the way down to minus 40. So that's a big difference between packaged chillers and modular chillers being able to do flooded head pressure control in that environment. All right, types of chillers that we have that are modular. We've got our ASP modular chiller, 10, 15, 20, 30, and 60 ton modules. You can build a chiller out all the way out to 840 tons using 10 60 ton machines or, or even more. You can do multiple banks, pipe them in parallel or pump them independently. Uh, we do offer independent refrigerant circuits. Uh, right now, everything's 410A, but we are working on alternative refrigerants down the road. Uh, probably gonna be a couple of years before those alternative refrigerants are vetted out by the compressor manufacturers. That free cooling option is optional. It comes in its own module. It looks almost identical to a mechanical module with compressors. Again. It's a water coil versus refrigerant coil. Um, we do have other um, modular chillers and I'll talk about the ARA at the end. We did touch upon that ARA chiller during the electrification uh, seminar last week. Common options we can do, again, standard fans, ECM fans. We can mount a number of low sound attenuation options on these. Again, our aforementioned low ambient and some high ambient, ambient capabilities. 
Uh, we do a lot of desert locations with our embassy work over in the Middle East, all the way up to 120 amb high ambient conditions. We go for a web portal. It can be constant flow. It can be variable flow. It can be standalone modules. Um, we can mount them on rails or lifting frame. All right, let's quickly talk about ASP modular chillers with free cooling modules. So this is just an example of how our free cooling works. If the ambient temperature is cold enough, we will send the water to that free cool module and pre-cool it in series with the mechanical modules. If it's too warm, our valve will not open, we bypass the free cools and we send our water to the mechanical modules. There may be a time we're doing partial free cooling as an assist, and then the mechanical modules are picking up the slack. We've done some really creative free cooling options in order to save footprint. So previous slide, we can stack a bunch of modules in a row. Our 30 ton modules can go back to back. So we can put a lot of free cools with mechanical modules, but our 60 ton modules get quite long. We've got to add they go end to end. And it might outreach the uh, chiller yard ability to you know, capture those. So we started thinking creatively about having a great amount of capacity with free cool and the smallest footprint. So um, this is our free cool sandwich. Uh, we've got our mechanical modules on the outside and our free cool modules sandwiched in between the outside mechanicals. Um, Mayo Clinic, they had X amount of chiller yard. They could not afford to, afford to string it out beyond their property line. So instead we went with the free cool sandwich uh, capability. So um, really great ways to get creative. Our, our 30 ton and below, since we draw the air from the face and the base of the module, we can also slide those modules up next to a wall. And then you can duct out duct out your discharge line above the roof edge. So that's a great footprint saver. You don't need uh, six, eight feet all around that chiller. We can get creative when it goes into a, a chiller yard with a wall or, or even a building right next to the chiller. All right, so that was our ASP, which is a mechanical module with independent free cools. The ASF is our latest design with integral free cooling as an option. Um, it's only a 30 ton module. Uh, this design has really taken off quite a bit for, I don't know, 150 ton jobs and below that have critical cooling are in locations or have a temperature which is very good for free cooling opportunities. It is a dual circuit machine. Again, an integral option, so the coil a refrigerant coil and hydronic coil, the fins go all the way through. It's not a layover coil. You can clean these by taking a hose and hosing from the inside out and pushing that debris off to the side, out of the coil. Other manufacturers do a sandwich coil. The fins don't line up. Once they get dirty on the inside, it's almost impossible to clean them. We can do low, low sound options. Uh, ECM fans is standard. That does help with sound quite a bit but we can also put ducted discharges on the top. We can put discharge attenuators on the top and get this machine even quieter, even compressor wraps. They don't do a heck of a lot on compressor wraps. We found most of the sound is due to fan, uh, fan discharge noise. So free cooling, um, it's kind of backing up a little bit. A lot of areas require free cooling or economizers to take advantage of the cooler ambient temperatures outside. It can be very, very significant savings, not only in dollars and energy when we're just doing free cooling, we're operating the pump still, we're operating fans, but we're not starting compressors. It can also prolong the life of your equipment when you're not turning compressors on, say at zero degrees or minus 10 degrees outside and having that uh, danger of, of flooding your compressors with, with refrigerant. Um, a lot of codes, a lot of uh, local codes do require this design. So I pulled real quick, I pulled Can Kansas City opportunities for free cooling. Um, I just assumed 44, 45 degree leaving chilled water. 
just to look at the opportunity hours. So I've got those blue transparent boxes at the bottom. Um, January, February, parts of March, parts of November and December. Um, pretty much all, you know, that's four, four and a half, five months of opportunity of free cooling at a 44, 45 degree set point. A lot of these data centers don't operate there. They're much higher. So your opportunity hours for free cooling certainly grows. Process coolers or chilled beam. Chilled beam, I've seen temperatures 50, 52 degrees. Again, your opportunity hours continue to grow. So I mentioned ASP modular, ASF modular, ASP free cools do get more free cooling capacity, but they have a longer footprint. The ASFs with integral free cooling have a very, very tight footprint. We're doing a lot of uh, 60, 90 ton air cool jobs with integral free cooling for these small data centers, small office buildings. They have a 10 by 10 room that has a 60, 80 ton load. It's a tremendous amount of load for these data closet or data rooms. Uh, more sound attenuating options can be applied to these modular chillers to get where you need to be. Give us the um, requirement at the uh, lot line or the requirement uh, for, the, for the property, and we can try and develop the minimum needed to meet those sound levels. And again, ASPs, the modular air cooled, 10 to 30 tons, I can push those up next to a wall, duct my discharge over the top of the wall, and you can run those since we draw the air from the face and the base. Accessories, we can do everything. Um, we can do a fully engineered designed drop and place, plug and play system. We can add our free cools, of course. We can add pumps, whether they be single, dual, or triplex pumps, a buffer tank, a glycol feeder, uh, strainers, air separators, Notice the tank, this is a 160 gallon buffer tank. Uh, it's fully insulated. We've got insulators in house. They do a fantastic job. In this um, application, we put in a dual basket trainer. Big fan of those. You don't have to disrupt your water flow. You turn the crank on the top, it diverts water to the side basket. You empty the one that's not being used. You can uh, carry on. You don't need to shut your system down. Uh, this one happens to have two uh, completely redundant single pumps. Uh, we'll, we'll basically use any pump manufacturer, whatever your preference is. Uh, these are mounted all on a steel base. So we can configure the entire chiller, uh, the entire system, and drop it right on the ground. A single point of power um, becomes plug and play for your contractor versus assembling everything on site putting out different bids uh, for all the different components. We can gather that all up into one package. Just a different shot of some mini glycol feeders and our larger glycol feeder for, for uh, obviously larger jobs that have larger capacity. Um, system has a small leak. It's got to make up water. It's got an alarm on it. Um, we can do auxiliary heat exchangers, again, multiple pumps. Just about anything you want, we, we can do in the factory under a control setting and meet your design requirements. Just an example of low sound attenuation, we put discharge silencers on the top of this chiller. Each bank is going to have its own dedicated discharge. So we're not sucking air, blowing air in, you know, in and around the machine. This would be a great example of going up next to a wall, blowing over the edge of the wall. Uh, ECM fans, easy for us to change out. Um, the, the quietest job that we've ever done, and as far as I know, maybe one of the quietest chillers anybody's ever heard of, 64 dBA at one meter. If you're in your office with nothing going but the sound of your laptop fan, that's about 64 dBA. So extremely, extremely quiet. We love the challenge. So quick summary of, of modular chillers. Anywhere you need redundancy, critical applications, process cooling, medical. We're doing a tremendous amount of uh, medical chillers right now. Uh, given they have a lot of uh, COVID relief money, they're putting in emergency uh, chillers. Uh, they, they're going full guns um, to, to serve their, you know, as a supplier to the medical industry and get our vaccines out there. So it's kind of fun being part of that. 
Don't forget the installation cost savings, hard to get to places, uh, smaller cranes, smaller helicopters if the job's high enough, Dip, difficult applications, wall installations up next to buildings. Future capacity add-on is really easy for us. You could make a place for it, or you could even not have it planned, just pull the caps off the end and, and figure out a way to add it on. Turn down. Because we have multiple machines with individual heat exchangers uh, versus a shell and tube or a large heat exchanger singular chiller, we can unload to that one module's worth of flow. That's pump savings. Um, what we have found on a lot of process loads, that's pretty beneficial. Um, they may not be operating all their processes at once. They're doing a batch here. The rest of the building is, is left dormant. So saving that pump energy and delivering the minimum amount of flow to your system is, 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 a, is a KW cost savings on the pump side. Much lower ambient capabilities. Our modular chillers, because of our flooded head pressure control, minus 20 is our standard low ambient design. Optional free cooling, we've got a number of ways to do it. We could have individual free cools or we can make them integral to the coil. More maintainable, if we've got a, a failure, failures happen, it's reality of life. If you've got that N plus one plus two capability, it doesn't become an emergency uh, to, to maintain your load. And again, the sound sense of applications, discharge attenuators, compressor wraps, a lot of creative ways we can do that. We'll stack them together. I did want to show a quick drawing of an array of our ASF. This is our 30 ton integral free cooling module machine. This happens to be a job we sent to Chicago, a job called Fan Steel. They're doing the medical process chillers. Um, they've got tremendous redundancy built in. They have two additional 30 ton modules, should one go down. Um, very compact design. And we've got six modules, so um, lots of redundancy built into this machine, into a very compact foot, footprint with that integral free cooling. All right, so some of this is a summary. I'm gonna jump over from modular to package chillers. Uh, our first seminar, we talked about mag bearing, oil free, all those benefits, uh, a system sustainability, having no oil in your system, all those parasitic loads, oil pumps, oil sumps, oil sensors, and oil itself damaging the long term performance of your chiller as it sticks to the uh, outside of the tubes and hinders heat transfer. Super quiet, super efficient, 80 to about 400 tons at ARI conditions. Um, this, this particular photo, it's just showcasing some of the alternative refrigerants that we already do offer. Standard EC fans, it's super, super quiet machine. Very efficient. Don't forget a couple weeks ago, we talked about flexibility of the mag bearing opportunity. Uh, we can have an indoor uh, evaporator controls and compressors, refrigerant piping out to a condenser, which could be adiabatic, lowering the amount of lift and work those compressors. Very, very efficient, very low water usage, no tower pump, no uh, tower bypass control. City water uh, goes into this machine. It doesn't need water treatment. Uh, no Legionella concerns. So a great way to have a super efficient package chiller indoors pipe to an adiabatic condenser outside. Another package chiller that we sell is our ASM. Uh, the A is for air stack, M is for medical. We, we built this chiller to go after the MRI CAT scan uh, chiller replacement. Uh, a lot of those uh, CAT scan MRI machines, they come with a chiller. You can't not buy the chiller that they're selling with it, but it's just a chiller. Um, there's really nothing special about it. We can have dual pumps. We can have a tank option, uh, ECM fan option, six to 30 tons. So if you've got a small chiller need, this could provide comfort cooling, critical cooling, or it could be for an MRI machine. Again, it's, it's simply a chiller that has a duty to do. ASC, um, this is our lowest cost 
um, air-cooled scroll machine trying to fill a niche in the market. Everybody's got one out there. It's a tough market to compete in. We're two to, to 190 tons. Uh, one unique option about it is I believe we're the only manufacturer that provides EC fans as an option all the way down to the 20 ton option. So it can be a very, very quiet fan, a quiet chiller. Uh, last week when we talked electrification, uh, I certainly can't not reiterate our specialty modular chiller, our scroll ARA, the ability of this air-cooled chiller to do both cooling, heating and simultaneous heating and cooling. This can be packaged with our um, ASP modular chiller. So if you've got a simultaneous load or a small heating load where your cooling load is much greater capacity, you can pair this machine with standard cooling only machines. It's not a desuperheater. You get 100% water to water heat recovery. Great COP is better than five. Again, 20, 30 and 60 ton modules. We can do those same packaged uh, pumping buffer tank uh, controls, uh, singular package, fully engineered at our factory uh, with the ARA as well. So that's, that's really my last slide. I'm gonna go look at the uh, Q&A, 39 minutes. All right, keeping her good. Okay, Bruce, let me get you. All right, Bruce, uh, fantastic job. Uh, can you hear me okay, Bruce? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, we, have, we have several questions here. Uh, we had a question early on when we first started on the ARAs. Um, is the five second start uh, restart time for normal cycling on and off or for some other situation that the compressor turns off? Yeah, the, the five second restart time is a programmable option. We would not typically do that on a regular chiller. We would have a two to three minute lag time uh, allowing the system to adjust. What we found was uh, certain owners had very small loops, no buffer, and that water would go out and come back and be immediately warmed and they wanted the absolute fastest restart time. Certainly outside the norm for comfort cooling, uh, there's ways to uh, improve or lag that time. It's not a necessity or a requirement that they restart every five seconds. Okay. Uh, the second question we have, uh, the free cooling option uh, does add some head to, uh, to the pumps. Is that correct? And um, if so, um, can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So they, they are in series with the mechanical modules. So if you're in a free cooling mode, we send the water through there and we suffer the pressure drop through the free cool. Then it's gonna to go to the mechanical and unless it hits set point, then that water is gonna go right out of the chiller to the load. Um, we try to keep the free cool pressure drop at less than 30 feet. Um, we've got a bypass in there. So if you've got equivalency in your free cools to mechanicals, um, your pressure drop is gonna be a lot less. So. Um, we've got to be concerned about pressure drop. It is going to increase the size of your pumps in your head. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, if they wanted to put that in a primary secondary with a separate pump, they could reduce that head pressure. So they had their free coolings as one lineup and their mechanical coolings as a separate, correct? Um, you, could, you could do that. Um, if pump pressure was a big deal. Well, that would be just like a side fluid cooler application. Right. Okay. Um, we, we do apply our standalone free cools as fluid coolers occasionally. It's not yep. very economical, I'll be honest. Okay. Um, but um, you could so that do kind of, that kind of in one bank. I'm sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say that blends to the next question. Are you ready to move on to that? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so our next question, uh, do these modular air-cooled chillers um, do they play well with other chillers? So for instance, can we build, if we have some other chillers, maybe 500 tons, we wanna add maybe uh, three or 400 more tons to an existing system. Is that something that we can hybrid into something that's existing well? Yeah, of course. Um, there'd probably be some balancing to make sure each chiller gets the right amount of flow. Um, uh, whether they're in parallel with the other chiller, that, that does present a problem. 
if your pump set point is 15 PSI to get water through the one chiller, but the next chiller is 20 PSI, there's got to be some balancing that needs to be taken into account, but yeah. absolutely can be done. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and we also offer a product called MultiPro where we can maximize the energy efficiency of a particular uh, site, including pumps and chillers. When we put these hybrid systems together, that might be something to look at is to let MultiStack look at the best energy solutions for you there. I'm just, you know, just to let people know about MultiPro. Um, next question. Um, can we can we use uh, these chillers in an application that might be a very low temp brine application, say like a, a 10, 14 degree uh, type application? Absolutely. Yeah, we do a lot of ice skating rinks. Um, ice skating rinks typically are about 15 to 22 degrees. Um, those we've done all the time, air cooled and water cooled ice making chillers. Uh, our bottom end temperature is about five degrees, five or six degrees. Right. Okay. One of the other Beyond questions. that, yeah. once we get lower than that, uh, we've got a sister company that handles these super low temp chillers. Uh, they can do minus 20, minus 40. They use different refrigerants. It's a whole different ball game, but about six degrees is our bottom end. Okay. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Um, I think you answered, uh, we had a question about uh, doing heat recovery um, and um, on the refrigerants and on the uh, uh, heat recovery there on the systems, but uh, is there anything special or that you want to add about heat recovery on refrigerant? Yeah, the, the ARA, kind of the, the slide I got up on the screen, is a full heat recovery machine. It's not a desuperheater. There's not just a small braze plate capturing what it gets. It's, it's forcing the machine to do 100% recovery. So the, the, the temperature that we've, the heat that we've extracted out of the evaporator side, we add motor heat, we dump all that heat into the condenser side, heat exchanger, water on the other side, and that's how we're able to use, uh, you know, convert this machine into a full water to water heat recovery chiller. Yeah, that's an exciting product and uh, really like that. Um, last question that we have um, right now coming in is, uh, is micro channel available for the condenser coils? Good question. We, we build our own coils. Um, we've got eight millimeter uh, micro, um, micro tubing, which has increased our heat transfer, but we have chosen not to do micro channel uh, because it's not repairable. So that's one reason. Um, it's also, while it's lighter and cheaper, we've chosen not to go that route, given the reliability of uh, um, copper tube, aluminum fin. Sure. Well, and with mo most of our applications, uh, our chillers are certainly applied in a lot of critical applications. So I can certainly see the reason for uh, being cautious with microchannel. I'll just say that. Okay. Um, we don't have any other questions. I just want to uh, let people know that uh, we really appreciate you coming on. This is part three of a four-part series. Part four is next Thursday at 11 o'clock. Bruce is going to be back to to wrap up this entire series on advanced chillers and chiller design. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, please stay on to fill out the survey so you can be registered uh, for the Traeger Grill. And uh, again, Bruce, fantastic job. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to next Thursday. Thank you all.